Uh, tonight, I will lead the Pledge of Allegiance. Please rise. <clears throat> your right hand over your heart. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, America. And, and to the republic for which it stands, stands one, one nation, nation under God, God indivisible, with liberty, liberty and justice and for all. all. It'll be nice to get back to our in-person meeting so we can do that uh, all together. Uh, we'll be moving on now to uh, comments from the audience on the only item on the agenda tonight. So we're now comments on item on the agenda as noted in the public advisory posted in the agenda. Staff will now read into the record the names and comments of emails received during the specified window in accordance with board bylaw 9323 meeting conduct. The comments will be read into the uh, record in the order the email was received. In the event that an unusual amount of emails, comments were submitted, the board will hear up to 30 minutes of comments. <clears throat> in the case of this, a single agenda item, the board can, if it chooses, hear the remainder of comments after all business has been conducted. Pat, did you receive any uh, emails regarding tonight's subject matter? Yes, however, there was one email received regarding an item not on this agenda, which will not be read into this record for that reason. The following email comments regarding the reopening of schools are as follows. From Vincent Coletta, I have three issues with my children returning to physical school. I work in an environment where I am more likely to be exposed to SARS COVID-2 and I don't want my children to expose others and their family members if that happens. I am an asthmatic and as such, I am more susceptible to SARS COVID-2 due to asymptomatic carriers. It is crucial that we adhere to strict social distancing and mask use. This is incredibly difficult for children who will forget to wear their masks may not wear them correctly and find it extremely difficult to maintain social distancing. While I can take precautions at work, I cannot do it at home with my family. Any lapse at school could expose my kids and risk my life. My wife is blind and, reason and responsible for getting our kids to and from school. She will have to rely on others to socially distance from her since she cannot see others waiting or approaching her. Seeing how people treat her, I don't trust anyone to do that. I do not want to risk the lives of teachers, staff, and other people's children's family or my children. Please provide a dedicated distance learning program until we either reach zero cases in the state or a safe vaccine is available. Opening back up now is irresponsible and we will leave the district and we'll leave the district open to lawsuits. A second wave is all but certain, so please act responsibly and do not reopen until it is actually safe to do so. Eric Wetzel. In a recent Zoom meeting, the teachers and aides of Boys Republic High School were told that face-to-face -face in classroom teaching for our boys would resume on July 6. During the meeting, some changes in procedure presented in an attempt to give the illusion of safety for both teacher and student were listed. I will not list said procedural changes here, but common sense will show you will show that the changes mentioned will not sufficiently improve the safety of anyone on the Boys Republic campus. Not the teachers, not the aides, not the BR staff, not the students. Many of our fellow teachers, myself included, are puzzled and concerned about this sudden call for a return to norm normalcy when normal and safe conditions are still nowhere in sight. Why are we doing this? The virus has not abated. Numbers are in fact rising. All reputable sources say the situation is not resolved. Our health and well-being still remains in question. The health and safety of the student body will remain in, still remains in question. Boys Republic is still accepting new boys and has, has been since the shutdown. Boys Republic is still giving out weekend home passes. There is nothing hermetically sealed about the conditions there. Whose call was this and what was the reasoning? Why was the current state of the virus in our state not taken into account? Why does it seem that the health and well-being of our teachers, aides, and indeed our students of Boys Republic High School were not taken into account? I, for one, do not wish to be the canary in the coal mine. I am not overly concerned for my own health, but I will not be an unwitting carrier of the virus to others, my aging parents and my loved ones with asthma most of all. Unfortunately, no matter how we might wish for this crisis to be over so that we can get back to teaching in a somewhat normal classroom setting, 
that time has yet not yet arrived. I wish it were different, but it isn't. Thank you, Eric. Let's see. From Rebecca Moon, Monique Tahari, Scott Player, and Shelley Burton. Dear Sir Madden, we the Chino Hills Aquatic Leadership staff wish to notify the board of our team's proposed plan to resume swim practices entitled Opening Plan, a plan to safety, safely resume practices. The opening plan contains exhaustive details regarding how our young athletes may safely resume organized exercise in the Chino Hills High School pool facility. The information contained within the plan is based off current recommendations from the CDC state and county health officials, safety, sanitation, and social distancing are taken into account throughout the entirety of the opening plan. We also respectfully request that we be allowed to present our opening plan to the board. It was drafted as both a written list of instruction and as a detailed slideshow. The slideshow in particular clearly illustrates our social distancing precautions through the use of visual aids and satellite imagery. We are confident that the opening plan will resume will reassure both the board and the public that organized swimming can be conducted without risk to the community. It is our hope that the board will agree with the Chino Hills Aquatic Leadership and its members that further delays to organized youth swimming as led by professional career coaches are not warranted. We believe the opening plan will be more than sufficient in addressing the board's concerns regarding the resumption of swim practices. We thank the board for their time in considering this matter and hope that you will be able to provide a safe environment for our children to exercise once more. Stacy Day. First, I would like to say that I understand that these are unprecedented times and schools are in an extremely tough position, stuck in between providing an effective learning environment for our kids while taking precautions to protect health. I have a son who is supposed to be entering 10th grade at Ayala this year. I say supposed to because it's a, because it Upon reopening schools, he is required to wear a mask, not allowed to interact with friends, not play sports, and live under a microscope with unrealistic rules. I absolutely will be pulling him out of public school for homeschooling. He finished the year with straight A's and a 4.0 GPA, but online learning has been satisfactory because he is missing out on the social aspects of high school, which as his parent, I believe are equally as important as his education. Interacting with others at this age will help frame him for effectively communicating and socializing with others, whether it be in, the, in a future job or just in everyday life. I will be the first to admit that I do not have all the answers on how to reopen schools safely. Some will say too little is being done. Some will say the opposite. There is no one size fits all approach for this. But what I do want as a parent is for my son to return to school so full of, is, is for my son to return to school so full of stress and anxiety, not allowed to be himself. Be social, make friends, play sports, connect with his teachers, and most of all, have to cover his face all day. I do not envy the position the board is in, but when it comes to my child and his education, as he will be, as he will only be this impressionable age once, I need to make sure that as a parent, that I have done all that I can to help shape him into an amazing, respectable man and contributing member of society. The way he is taught and the environment he is taught in will play a huge role in his life. And I refuse as his parent to put him in an environment that will negatively impact his growth, education, and social skills. This is, uh, this is a repeat from Rebecca Moon, Monique Tahari, Scott Player, Shelley Burton regarding the aquatics leadership staff. The next email is from Kristen Coletta. Dear school board members, thank you for taking the time to thoughtfully consider all the possibilities and potential for the upcoming school year. I am Dr. Coletta and I am the mother of a rising first grader at Whitman Elementary in Chino Hills. I am concerned for the safety of our teachers, my daughter and the rest of my family. Even if students are required to wear masks, prevention requires perfection, which simply isn't possible with lots of kids. I encourage you to create a distance online learning option I will show how this would help our teachers and students based on my experience teaching college courses online for the past nine years. The online curriculum is presumably already in place for those students studying through the alternative education home-based independent study distance option and would need to be ramped up for widespread use. You could solicit volunteers from among your faculty to be dedicated to the online distance students. Class sizes should not be increased for online faculty it takes just as much time to plan, execute, provide feedback, and grade online classes as traditional in-person classes. There is time before the start of the school year for faculty to prepare to teach in this virtual environment. 
all distant track would be would allow teachers and students to safely teach and safely learn remotely. The more families and teachers who opt into such a track, the fewer, the fewer people you will need to account for in classrooms, which will allow for greater social distancing and a smaller number of people together at once. This should reduce strain on facilities and lower the risk of infection for those on campuses. Implementing an online track will better situate our district if, predicted, if the predicted second wave of virus peaks during the fall and students can no longer safely attend class. An online track would also ensure students who otherwise might be pulled from public schools out of safety concerns to continue to receive a quality education. Thank you for your consideration. From Andrea M. Baker, dear cabinet and school board members. First, thank you for considering the teachers viewed through the ACT survey. However, the survey encompassed all learners collectively and did not separate across the grade levels, which directly impacts performance and abilities. I am speaking specifically today to the developmental learning needs of TK through second grade students. I believe first and foremost that we all would prefer the full traditional model. But if this is not the case, I am requesting that the hybrid model be used beginning in grades three and up. These students are more capable to use technology as a tool in the curriculum through a blended distance learning approach. I'm asking you to consider what pediatricians recommend on the best use of technology. Through their research, they have found that students age six and under should have no more than one hour of technology use a day, considering that the hybrid model would not be the developmentally appropriate model for these learners. In research from the American Academy of Pediatrics, parents are asked to limit use of technology for their young children. Therefore, a hybrid model where students TK through two are asked to attend to technology more than one hour a day could be detrimental to their ability to fully learn using this practice. Our young learners need teaching with their teachers to provide in-person instruction in the foundations of learning to read, write, and develop mathematical skills. Teachers in grades TK through two can only successfully set the foundations of learning to read, write, and develop mathematical skills in an in-class setting. These students also need the socialization, routine study, discipline building, learning that can only occur in person. They need the interactive quality of classroom instruction and feedback. In 27 years of experience as an elementary teacher, reading specialist, and now curriculum coach, I know the importance of this. I implore you to investigate a model where TK grade students meet daily with their teachers for half day and spend minimal time at home with digital tools. Jamie Falls. I am writing this comment as both a CBUSD teacher and parent of four CBUSD students. I am writing to strongly urge the board to offer a plan that allows the full return to school this upcoming school year. I also strongly urge the board to, to look at another local district placenta Yorba Linda's plan for return. Distance learning is not what's best for students, parents, or families. Students need to be in the classroom working and interacting with peers and teachers. As a CBUSD teacher, I cannot effectively teach my own class while simultaneously teaching my own children through distance learning. I also cannot be expected to teach full time in situations where students are broken into groups by days a.m. and p.m. While my own children are expected to be distance learning from home, who will watch them and ensure they are doing their work? Am I now responsible for paying for children that for childcare that is not an expense I am used to paying for? I know other working families will be in the same situation. It's an unrealistic and ineffective task. Please allow a plan that allows the full return to school. If some families and teachers are not ready for this, give them alternative options, but the rest of us should be able to return to normal life. Thank you for your time and consideration. Christ Christina Trucios, dear board members, when considering options for reopening schools, please keep in mind that Cal Arrow is a year round school that is beginning the 2021 20, school year on July 6th. More than a full month than traditional school begins. Cal Arrow families need information about what the instructional plan will be so that we can plan ahead appropriately. As the beginning of the next school year is two and a half weeks, a, a half weeks away. We need time to find childcare and make arrangements with our employers if students are not going to be in the classroom full time. Danielle Foster. Thank you board members for allowing parents to voice their opinions as it relates to the upcoming school year. It is known that a significant amount of language learning in the areas of nonverbal communication, empathy, perspective taken and problem solving takes place in the early years of our children's academic careers and grows 
into more sophisticated understanding of language in the forms of figurative language, idioms, and humor as they graduate to higher grades. This learning, no matter the age, is done so visually through observation and watching. It is the observations made through social interaction and play amongst peers that continue to develop and refine pragmatic language and life skills. It is the development of these social language skills that often influence academic performance and determine the success of our child's relationships and most of the learning taking place during our child's school day. I am advocating for the social, emotional, and physical well-being of our kids in school. The Center for Disease Control and Prevention states that, the, that of the first 68,998 U.S. deaths from COVID-19, only 12 have been, in the, have been in children age under 14 less than 0.02%. Nor is coronavirus killing teenagers. At last count, the fatality total among children under 18 without an underlying condition is one. Only 10 in of the 16,469 confirmed coronavirus deaths in New York City were among those under the age of 18. The district has set up safe measures for faculty and students to return, require personal hygiene, health and safety course before returning to school consistent and proper hand washing throughout the day and sanitization of highly used services before and after use. Temperature checks upon arrival, lighten up the policy on absences. Our culture and the financial bottom line of our state encourages parental workers and adolescent students alike to show up when sick. Drop the perfect attendance awards and let students rest and recover before returning to school instead of spreading illnesses throughout the classroom. If our children are not returning to hybrid learning with any portion of their day distance learning, much less the entire school year distance learning, we have no other option than to enroll in homeschooling curriculum. I have attached a supporting newspaper article that addresses many of the community's concerns as well as the CDC data quoted above. Marie Bonovitz, dear CVUSD board, I wanted to share my thoughts regarding options for the 2021 school year. If the option is to do a hybrid, I would like to propose for teachers to live stream via Google Meet or Zoom, for example, classroom lessons, activities, et cetera, for the students who are at home. If teachers will already have students in the classroom, why not live stream for the students who are at home? Some benefits of doing live stream for the students who are at home include receiving continued or academic instruction from certified teachers, not parents allowing students to feel part of the classroom and staying on the same track with activities, lessons, et cetera, with the whole class. Receiving academic instruction from their teachers will be more advantageous for the students, the students being expected to do independent work. It will, also, it will also be helpful for parents instead of the parents teaching their kids at home as to what happened during distance learning these past few months. Thank you very much for reading my message and for considering this option. I appreciate your time. Janine Madera, good afternoon. I hope this message finds everyone well. I understand that our school board is considering the important task of reopening our schools this fall. I am sure your goal is to balance the education of our students need and deserve with appropriate reasonable safety precautions to protect our students, staff and all of our families. I am writing to ask that you make sure to include performing arts in the district's plans. These activities require different procedures in a traditional class. As you know, performing arts is an important part of our curriculum, not only as a requirement for graduation and many colleges and universities, but it also plays a vital, vital role in the social and mental health of our students and the entire community that enjoys the products of their creative endeavors. I look forward to hearing your plans for our students and would invite you to reach out to the respective performing arts teachers, students, and boosters organizations for their input and ideas. Thank you for your time and consideration. Bridget Meredith, hello. As part of the planning process of the reopening of the school district and the support programs, has consideration been given to the opening of the Cal Arrow Preserve Joint Use Library? As San Bernardino County starts to reopen its library's facilities, will the Joint Use Library be opening? Cal Arrow Preserve Academy, being a year-round school, will start remotely in July, from my understanding. The library provides support to the school and community Many students in the community find the library a place of academic support. Thank you for your consideration. Chao Wen, please make it clear to guardians the need to enforce masks and temperature checks in the classroom for students and staff to reduce the spread of the virus from asymptomatic carriers. Have an online procedure to, tra to track and trace infections. Guardians need to adhere to health restrictions 
for the safety of the community to continue their public education. Please prepare staff and community to know that protocols will change based on the science and guidelines from local health officials and to be prepared to be flexible. Please have a protocol that all are aware of when students or teachers get sick or in the case that someone does die from COVID while on campus, we are all only as safe as our neighbor. I like my freedoms, but I like living to enjoy it more. Be the leaders we need to protect our communities with sound enforceable policies that may not be popular, but are necessary. Thank you. There are no further email comments regarding this agenda. Thank you very much, Pat. Uh, real quick, just wanted to address the one email that we received that was not related to tonight's uh, agenda item. For the record, uh, for the author of that, please know that that was shared with all the board members and each board member had the opportunity to read it in its entirety. You're also uh, welcome to resubmit it for our next regularly scheduled meeting on Thursday if you'd like it to be read into the record. <clears throat> Moving on now to tonight's only agenda item, a board study session for the 2021 reopening of schools. Uh, Dr. Enfield, will you please present and proceed with tonight's item? All right. <clears throat> President Schaefer, members of the board, tonight we're presenting the district's plan for reopening the schools for the 2020-21 school year. Before we begin the presentation, I want to give an update on two schools and some background on their reopening plan. First, Cal Arrow Preserve Academy, our only K-6 year-round school, will begin the 2020-21 school year with three tracks starting school on July 6, 2020. Cal Arrow will begin with distance learning 2.0, and you'll hear a little bit more about that later on. So they'll start with distance learning and will not transition to any different learning options if they are available until August 10, 2020, when all of our traditional schools would return back to, to school. The other thing I wanted to talk about was the Boys Republic schools. Um, at Boys Republic is a school where, where students are placed there by the courts throughout the, the state of California. Because Boys Republic has circumstances that are a little bit unique uh, than our other schools, that there are some things that are in place there that are different. And we're looking at bringing the staff back and starting with in-person instruction beginning July 6. Uh, the preventive procedures consistent they, that they have at Boys Republic consist of all the students are tested with COVID-19 with a medical release from the juvenile program before any student is placed over at Boys Republic. The staff over there has um, since March has been uh, they have temperature checks that are conducted for all staff members before they enter onto the campus. And then if we were to start instruction over there, there would be temperature checks would be conducted daily for the students that attend classes. Uh, currently, Boys Republic has had zero positive cases for students and staff members. Uh, currently, there are 64 students at Boys Republic. And on average, that's a class size ratio, again, on average of six students to one teacher. The boys live together, they live in cottages, and they don't need to be physically distance, uh, distancing themselves based on those requirements. It's basically like living in a, in a house when you were quarantined with your family. That's their, their basic family there. Um, really there, the threat really is more from the outside bringing COVID-19 onto the campus and infecting our students more so than our students infecting any of our, our staff members. And so looking at these uh, distancing, looking at uh, being able to control that environment, which is much different than our other classrooms that we're looking at the different models of instruction uh, in classroom instruction with our students. That's just a couple of updates on, on two of the schools. Now into the uh, reopening plan. What you'll see tonight is a extensive amount of work that went in to preparation and to the development of our reopening plan for the 2021 school year. I've attended numerous meetings led by Ted Alejandro, the superintendent of San Bernardino County Department of Education, along with all the superintendents in our county and with the San Bernardino County Department of Health. 
and all of those meetings have been folk are those, those last several meetings have been focused in on the reopening of schools. Our last meeting was just this last Friday on uh, June 12th that we all met with the County Department of Health. Also, there are several groups of superintendents that I meet with on a pretty consistent basis. There's a group in San Bernardino on the West End that I, I meet with. There are a group from Orange County and from Los Angeles County. And the specific focus of when we're meeting is we're talking about that reopening of schools and the sharing of ideas and, and what's going on as we develop plans for reopening. Uh, Dr. Park, the Associate Superintendent of Curriculum has been meeting with her counterparts across the state regarding the different, different models of reopening schools. Ms. Chin, the Asso Associate Superintendent of Business Services has been meeting with her counterparts across the state on reopening and budget implications as it relates uh, to the schools and reopening. Mrs. Fellows, the Assistant Superintendent of Curriculum has been meeting with her counterparts regarding the health and safety and specifically in the area of health and safety. Her, along with our Director of Health Services, Dr. Johnson and our lead nurse, Deborah Martinez, have really have, been, have attended a, a tremendous amount of, of Zoom meetings, uh, webinars with the different uh, health departments, state level and at the county level. Uh, Mr. Stratur, our Assistant Superintendent of Facilities, Operations and Planning, has been meeting with his counterparts regarding facilities and transportation. And Mr. Rich Rideout, our Assistant Superintendent of Human Resources, has been meeting again with his counterparts regarding uh, employee issues and risk management. I don't share this to say there's been a lot of meetings. I share this so that you can see the tremendous amount of ideas and resources that we have brought forward in developing our reopening plan. This wasn't just a plan that was, was done in isolation. Also, our reopening plan was shared with the San Bernardino County Department of Health. They do not approve plans. And let me reiterate that again, the County Health Department does not approve plans. However, we worked collaboratively with the San Bernardino County Department of Health to review our plan and provide recommendations which were incorporated into our reopening plan. We also submitted our reopening plan to the San Bernardino County Office of Education. They reviewed the plan and they asked if it was okay if they could share it with the rest of the school districts in our county. And we were happy to do so. And I think that kind of speaks volume to the work that staff put in into developing our reopening plan. Last um, but not least on this, I want to take a moment and I want to thank uh, Brenda Walker, the president of ACT uh, and her leadership team. And I also want to thank Danny Hernandez, the president of CSEA and his leadership team. Uh, we are very fortunate and grateful for our relationship with ACT and CSEA. They have been very supportive and collaborative and they have focused on problem solving and finding solution to a number of, of, of issues uh, regarding the shutdown all the way up into the reopening plan. And I know that relationship will continue as we move through this process. And again, I'm very grateful for our partnerships with both unions. Three things I wanna share about the plan that staff looked at when we started to go into the development of it. The first one, I wanna talk a little bit about safety. And under safety, one of the things that staff did is they looked at all the different documents that came out from the CDC. There were a number of guidelines, the California Department of Education guidelines, AXA guidelines, uh, guidelines from other county agencies. Uh, we wanted to look at everything. We looked at the San Bernardino County uh, Readiness Reopening Plan, and the, San, uh, and the counties also has a health guidelines for reopening that we used in the development of, of our reopening plan and did a crosswalk with those and incorporated those ideas into the plan. The other part uh, under safety before we reopened, we wanna, we wanna make sure before we, we bring any students back that we have enough supplies, safety supplies. Uh, we're looking at masks, face shields, hand sanitizers, hand sanitizer stations, gloves, thermometers, cleaners, and disinfecting along with barriers, signage, traffic flow patterns, because we're looking at how do you traffic move in and out of, of our facilities. And, and, and again, that's gonna be a piece. We've started to, uh, we ordered um, 
equipment and supplies since uh, uh, March, early, early March. Uh, we continue to order stuff and stuff is coming in, but not all of the supplies have come in as of yet. Uh, we're expecting most of them to be in by July. But again, that's a critical piece that we have to have a, a sufficient stockpile before we would even look at bringing any students back or bringing a group of students back at the beginning of August 10th. The other thing is you, you come up with a plan. Um, it's one thing to have a plan. It's one thing to take that plan and put it into action. And so one of the things that we have done is we've sent the draft plan to all of our principals and we have shared that draft plan uh, for reopening with them. And then we are going out to the school sites with our, our principals and administrators uh, with, led by the district and walking the school site and actually looking at the plan and what does it mean in the implementation process? Because we want them to clearly understand that as they start to develop uh, their schools for the potential of possibly reopening. And so that was a critical part for us. And so we continue to do that. We'll also ask our principals to meet with a small group of uh, staff members and continue that uh, walk with staff members and looking at how, how they can use the plan into implementation at their specific site. And so those were kind of some big areas in the area of safety regarding the plan. The second thing that we looked at in bringing back or creating the plan is bringing back our students. You know, the research is really clear that the majority of students, and I'll say that again, the majority of students perform better when they meet in person with their teacher all day, five days a week. They perform better academically and just as important, I think socially and emotionally, it's a huge piece for our students. And so our goal is to return our students safely. And again, that's the key word in here, that safely to in-person instruction and to get back to the five days a week. Uh, and again, you're gonna look in our, our, our plan uh, regarding that, but that's one of the pieces. That's, that's what we did before COVID-19. And we know that's the best model and that's where we do wanna get to. Doesn't mean that we're there, but that's where we wanna ultimately get back to. Third, we wanted to ensure in the reopening plan that parents had a choice. And this was very important to us. Um, again, you, you heard the comments tonight. I received numerous emails. I read them all, did not respond to all of them. Uh, there was a, a lot of them, I can share that. Uh, but the spectrum went, went from wanting their child to not return back to school and everything in between to where they want their child to return back to school all day in person with their teacher. Uh, we believe that the state will give us the flexibility to meet the needs of our parents as part of this plan. When, uh, as part of the plan, we're going to be sending out two surveys to our parents. It will be the same survey going out twice. And I know that may sound a little confusing, but we have two surveys that we wanna send out and it's gonna be the same one going out twice but both have a different pur purpose for the district. So the first survey is to provide data for the district to prepare for the learning options that Dr. Park is gonna cover a little bit later tonight. Parents will need to complete a survey for each individual child. So if you have one child, you complete one survey. If you have two, you would complete two surveys. If you have three and so on you would complete the number of surveys on the number of children in your household. The first survey will open tomorrow on June 17th and it will close on June 24th. The survey will ask for your child's name, which is optional on this one, the school, the grade level, and the learning option that you're interested in. And again, this survey is for the district to gather the data to finalize our plan and to execute for a smooth opening for the schools. Because based on the different options, we have to look at staffing, we have to look at license agreements, there's a number of different things we have to do behind the scenes to be able to prepare for that. And so again, we're asking the parents to please take that survey. The second survey will come out around the second, third week of July. We wanted to give parents more time before they committed 
to which learning option they wanted to select. I know a number of people are like, I'm already committed Dr. Infield where I'm ready to make that selection. Um, but we wanted to make sure they still had some opportunity because if a parent selected in June 17th, a lot can happen between now and, and August 10th. And so we thought we would come back in July and then uh, have a second survey. And this is for the, the final decision for parents to, to lock in of which option they want. Again, on this survey, the student's name will be required. You'll have the schools, you select the school, what grade level your child's going into and the learning option. And based on the options, we will schedule and program and contact parents for signing up. So let me explain a little bit on that. Depending on the option that a parent picks, the district may need to contact you and to register you in, into a program to help support you for that program. If they are coming back to schools in one of the different programs that we're gonna to show tonight, then we have to either build that master schedule for your student schedules at the secondary, at the junior high and high school, or at the elementary, we need to put you into a classroom with a teacher. And so that's gonna be the critical part of why at that point we need that name so that we can identify the student and the different programs that they're gonna go into. And so we thought that that way we would have the, the parents would be able to provide that input on those different options. And so with that, let me get into now the, the presentation. So we look at the, as part of our reopening plan, we looked at the stages of reopening schools based on the model for the California Resilient Roadmap that the governor put out. And in that he has uh, four stages. And I think we're all probably pretty much familiar with that. The stage one is where we began our uh, distance learning as we're calling it 1.0. That was our first, um, first time in March when we closed the schools and went into that distance learning. The governor then said that he would start to reopen the state in these different stages. And so he opened us up into stage 2A a little bit ago. And, and in that, that's when schools are allowed to actually reopen according to the governor's plan. It was in stage 2A. And then in 2B, they start to, as we all know, they start to allow more businesses to start opening up. And, and again, in 2B, that is where we are currently as a county. I know there is a little bit of the lines have been blurred because in stage three, the governor has taken businesses and moved them into stage two and allowed them to open up. But according to our conversation with the county, we're in 2B and I think we're moving very closely maybe to entering stage three. And then stage three, is uh, where they bring more high risk businesses on board. And then the final stage, stage four, uh, according to the governor, was that stage four would, would reach when we had a uh, herd immunity, or I believe with a vaccine that we would look at the stage four of opening into stage four. So we took our plan and what we wanted to do is look at the, based on these stages of, we would follow and bring, bring our students back in the different stages giving parents the options though, during that. We didn't want to lag behind, but we didn't want to be out in front. And so we came up with a plan that we think kind of mirrors and follows some of these stages as we move through that. The next slide, please. So tonight, what we're gonna do is the guidelines for reopening schools. Dr. Park is gonna talk about the learning options. Ms. Fellows will talk about the well-being. The, uh, Mr. Stutter will talk about facilities and operations, and Mr. Rideout will cover a little bit under operations. Um, Ms. Chin will cover our meal services related to our plan, and then I'll come back and I'll finish up with communication training and the coordination of services. And then at that point, board, uh, we'll open it up for, for questions. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Park. Dr. Park, you're muted. Thank you, Dr. Enfield. Our plan for opening our schools will be determined by San Bernardino County's placement on that California Resilience Roadmap and in consultation with guidance from our County Department of Public Health. Because our county covers such a large geographic area, consultation with County Public Health is going to be equally important because the data in our community may warrant a different type of opening. Currently, as Dr. Enfield mentioned, 
our county is officially in the later stages of 2B, quickly transitioning into stage three. While we have been monitoring the placement of the roadmap, we've also been actively preparing for three learning options so that we can be ready to open our school safely for our students and staff. At the time of reopening and to be able to adhere to the health orders at the time, distance learning will be offered if we are in stage one, 2A and 2B. Blended learning will be offered in stage 2B and stage three. And traditional instruction will be offered in stage three and four. We do have surrounding districts that have made announcements that they will be opening with traditional instruction, which is bringing all students back together for daily instruction every day. In the next segment of this presentation, we're gonna spend some time understanding the teaching and learning for the three different learning options. When we closed our schools in March, our teaching staff did an incredible job transitioning to distance learning. We've learned a lot during this time and while we may have been caught off guard in March, we're ready to provide our students with a 2.0 teaching and learning experience if we do open up with distance learning. We've spent a significant amount of time reflecting, gathering input from a variety of groups, including the feedback gathered from our LCAP parent advisory group and our teachers who have participated on our planning committees to help design our learning options. Distance Learning 2.0 is a scaled up version that reflects our constituents' feedback and our reflection to offer a more rigorous and engaging learning experience for students in a virtual setting. Distance Learning Classroom web pages will function as the information hub for teaching and learning. Following a common layout that will be consistent across all teachers' web pages, Families, especially with multiple children, will benefit from this consistency. There will be two district supported platforms, Google Classrooms and Microsoft Teams, which will function as virtual classrooms. Staff will provide daily instruction through synchronous instruction, where the teacher is present at the same time as the learner, providing face-to-face -face instruction in a virtual setting. Other great teaching tools are also gonna be utilized through asynchronous instruction with students doing things like watching pre-recorded videos, participating in discussion threads, which can be followed up during the face-to-face -face instruction with their teacher. Social emotional learning will also be a critical part of routine teaching and learning. And attendance is going to be tracked daily with the check-ins with their teacher. We're looking at a sample distance learning elementary schedule. At the elementary school, live synchronous instruction will occur four times a week with a strong emphasis on grade level essential standards in English language arts and math, which will be our guaranteed and viable curriculum. On this schedule, whole class instruction takes place Monday through Wednesday and on Friday. The wide ranges in instructional times for English language arts and math reflect the accommodations we will have to make based on the grade level. Our kindergarten students will receive a shorter block versus our sixth grade students will be able to sustain a longer instructional block. When we open our classrooms again, we're going to have to be prepared for learning losses, but we're also going to have to be able to equally support our students who may come to us even more prepared. For this, we have planned small group support in English language arts and math, which minimally occur four times a week to provide intervention and to extend the learning for our students. One day a week, and you'll see here on a Thursday, 
There's dedicated time to address social emotional needs for our students through second step lessons and designated English learner development lessons, which will be provided not only on Thursday, but five days during the week. In the next three slides, we're going to take a look at some sample secondary distance learning schedules. Each of the samples have its own merit and a final determination for what our schools will be using at the junior high and high schools will be made at a later time. This option represents a traditional bell schedule with students attending all of their distance learning classes in one day. Because students would have daily synchronous instruction, virtual office hours would not be offered in this model. Here is our second option in our distance learning classroom. In this option, students would attend whole class virtual periods four times during the week. On Monday and Wednesday, students would participate in longer virtual sessions for periods one, three, and five, and attend longer second, fourth, and sixth periods on Tuesday and Thursday than we saw in comparison to the traditional sample schedule. An additional support period would happen on a designated day and in the schedule, you'll see it on a Friday. And that's to allow our teachers to virtually meet with individuals in small groups or even their entire class to provide intervention or extension and to assess or reassess for learning. On this schedule, again, it's reflected on Friday. In this model, there would be a minimum of three virtual office hours for students to check in with their teachers for questions or to be asked or to ask for additional support. Here's our final secondary distance learning sample schedule. Students would attend each period five times throughout a 10 day instructional block. With more teacher contact across 10 days, this model does not have a built-in day for additional support. And there would be three virtual office hours in this model. Our second learning option is called blended learning. Sometimes it's also referred to as hybrid learning. To reduce the number of students at school and in a class, students are divided into two cohorts, cohort A or cohort B. Each cohort spends a few days of instruction in a classroom setting, and the remainder of student work is completed at home. And the learning may be enhanced with online or virtual learning. So let's take a look at some sample schedules. Here is an elementary blended learning classroom. And again, this is a sample schedule. As you can see, one class has been divided into two cohorts. Half of the class would represent cohort A and the other half would be cohort B. Cohort A would attend school on Monday and Thursday and cohort B would attend in-class instruction on Wednesday and Friday. On Tuesday, which is the elementary school's regularly scheduled minimum day, English learners would receive designated English language development and all students would minimally receive 30 minutes of social emotional learning through second steps. And teachers would have an opportunity to meet with smaller groups of students on Tuesday to provide intervention or extension in English language arts or math. And for the entire week, the focus would be on incorporating those essential standards across all content areas. Now let's take a look at some sample secondary schedules for blended learning. In this sample, 
each period is divided into two cohorts. Half of the cohort represents cohort A, and the other period or class represents cohort B. Each cohort would attend every period or class five times over a 10 day period. There would not be an additional support period. And in this model, there would not be virtual office hours. In our final sample of a blended learning secondary schedule, each cohort would attend in-class instruction for each period two times a week and attend the additional support period that you're seeing here on a Friday. A minimum of 10 minutes of office hours per course would be provided during the week. And our final learning option is our traditional instruction, which is face-to-face -face instruction every day with the entire class. However, with our experiences we had with our closures, our students would return to school to experience a 2.0 version with traditional instruction. There would be a renewed focus on essential standards with frequent formative checks for student learning, increased use of student engagement strategies to help students be more involved with their learning, and understanding that students would have felt stress and grief from COVID-19, the need to incorporate trauma-informed practices as a standard supporting teaching and learning through the integration of technology across all of our content and ensuring articulation of our teaching expectations across grade levels and courses to better meet our students' learning needs. And all through strength and practices of collaboration across teacher teams. However, we do understand that families will not be comfortable returning to school with the learning options that will be available depending on the stage we are in when we open. For these families, other options will include home-based independent study, distance learning, our virtual program at the Alternative Education Center, and our home hospital program. Continuing, Mrs. Fellows will now address the well being preventive procedures that will be in place to support our students. Thank you so much. Wellness. Wellness is a priority for our district, and we have been working in collaboration with health officials in making the decision to safely reopen. Health Services has participated in hours of webinars, meetings, and discussions to create and review safety guidelines and protocols for the district. For safety, personal protective equipment, also known as PPE, should be used. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, state and local public health departments, and San Bernardino County all recommend for students to wear face coverings while at school, and especially when physical distancing cannot be maintained. To start, the district has purchased the following PPE, 500 no-touch thermometers, 39,000 disposable masks, 2,000 hand sanitizers, eight ounce bottles, 30 hand sanitizer stations, 1,800, uh, um, I'm sorry, additional hand sanitizers, but 32 ounce bottles, 5,000 disposable gowns, 1,500 face shields, 925 distancing signage, 925 arrows, 1,700 face shields, 5,000 gloves. In addition, the California Office of Emergency Services is allocating PPE to school districts to assist with getting schools reopened. Supplies are the state's estimation of what is needed for the first 60 days and will include cloth face masks, disposable face masks, face shields, hand sanitizers, N95 masks, and touchless thermometers. For health screening, 
as part of safely reopening, passive and active health screenings will be conducted. Passive screenings includes temperature and symptom checking at home by parents and guardians before school. Education of the signs, symptoms outlined by CDC will be provided such as fever, cough, shortness of breath, and difficulty breathing. Additionally, the district will engage in active symptom screening, which will include visual wellness checks and temperature checks with no touch thermometers. Sites will be provided the no touch thermometers. Hygiene. Optimal hygiene practices will be ensured, including the education, training, and promotion of good hygiene practices, such as hand washing or the use of the recommended hand, san hand sanitizers to prevent infections. Individuals will be encouraged to wash hands, use hand sanitizers after blowing their nose, coughing, sneezing, after using the restroom, before and after eating food, touching their face, after playing outside, and, and the cleaning of frequently touched areas. Scheduled hand washing routines will be employed along with the posting of hand washing guidelines. The isolation room. A designated isolation room will be identified at all sites. Personal protective equipment will be utilized in conjunction with universal precautions and proper hand hygiene. Active screening that includes symptom checking and temperature checks with no touch thermometers will be conducted. The health services protocol will be followed for students suspected of having COVID-19 symptoms. Some of these steps include calling 911 if the student is in distress, taking the student's temperature, completing the COVID-19 symptom checklist contacting the parent or guardian to pick up the student and advising them to consult with their primary physician. Making appropriate medical referrals if student does not have a primary physician. The district will report on-site positive cases of COVID-19 to the San Bernardino County Public Health Department. Based on their recommendation, dismissal of students may occur anywhere from two to five days. The initial short-term dismissal allows time for local health officials to gain a better understanding of the COVID-19 situation impacting the school and to help the school determine appropriate next steps, including whether an extended dismissal duration is needed to stop or slow the further spread of COVID-19. Dismissal duration may include anywhere from two to five days to 14 days to a month. Schools play a critical role in contact tracing. In contact tracing, public health staff work with students, school parents, guardians, to help the student recall everyone with whom they had close contact with during the time frame while they may have been infectious. Here are two examples of possible scenarios. Scenario one, during active screening, a student is found to have a fever. The student will be sent directly to the isolation room for another temperature and symptom check and staff will record the people the student may have had contact with. The student is found to have a fever and other possible COVID-19 symptoms. Parent guardian will be contacted for student pickup immediately. Guidance will be provided to encourage parent guardian to contact the, their healthcare provider, excuse me, for follow-up. The school nurse will follow up with parent on students' health condition, outcome of visit to the medical provider, and or isolation that may be needed. If the student tests positive for COVID-19, public health will be contacted. The district will assist by providing information in accordance with current public health protocols and applicable families will be notified. The isolation room will be and all other rooms cleaned and disinfected as needed. Public health may potentially recommend no closure or the dismissal of the entire class. There are many variables. Scenario two, during the school day, a student begins to present symptoms and had visited his classroom, lunchroom, and various offices on campus. All the steps previously described will be implemented. The San Bernardino County Department of Public Health will be contacted and the district will assist by providing information as requested. 
the isolation room, classroom, and other areas will be cleaned and disinfected. The district will follow guidance from public health to determine if notification to other parents is necessary if a public health concern is identified such as a COVID-19 positive test result. Public health, again, may potentially recommend dismissal of the entire class, offices, or whole school to monitor all students and staff for COVID-19 symptoms. Returning from illness. Students returning from illness after an absence due to COVID-19 related illness may report to school with one of the following criteria met. Symptom based at least three days or 72 hours must pass um, and be and a student must be symptom free according to the CDC public health guidelines. Students must report to the health office before returning to class. Passive and active screening will be employed upon the student's return to school. We want to ensure the student has been symptom free again for at least 72 hours defined as a re resolution of fever without uh, fever free without the use of fever reducing medications and improvement in respiratory symptoms such as cough shortness of breath and at least 10 days that have passed since symptoms first appear. Students must return to school with a note from their provider and return to the school health office prior to returning to class. Now, I'd like to introduce, introduce Mr. Greg Satura. Thank you, Leah. Good afternoon, Board President Schaefer, members of the board. The facilities planning and operations have several processes and procedures in place or in the works for our school sites, and I will be covering those in the next few slides. Physical distancing. Previously mentioned by Dr. Enfield and Dr. Park, physical or social distancing is one of the first lines of defense in avoiding the transmission of COVID-19. By limiting the number of students on campus at any given time, based on the different learning options presented, we will be able to maintain safe distancing among individuals. Additionally, with the use of outdoor spaces and playgrounds, as well as larger gathering spaces, such as gyms and multipurpose rooms for bigger groups, we can ensure that the safe distancing can be better accomplished. Maintenance and Operations Department has measured all district departmental workstations and school offices, as well as interactive spaces with the public for the installation of protective plexiglass dividers and guards. Installation of these guards will begin at Cal Arrow Preserve Academy beginning this week, followed by multiple critical district departments and continue at the remaining schools through the next month. Signage. The district's duplicating and reprographics department has created hygiene signage for placement district-wide. Additionally, we have purchased social distancing and directional arrow floor markings. This signage is very similar to what you see in, gro in grocery stores and will help create a traffic flow pattern into and out of our schools and the district office buildings. Ventilation. Our HVAC technicians have checked and adjusted all HVAC, HVAC units to ensure that the fresh air intake vents are set to 20% open, which is the maximum allowable per Title 24. This will ensure proper ventilation of classrooms and offices while maintaining the optimum operation and performance of the HVAC systems. We're also continuing the use of hospital grade MERV 16 HVAC filters, and they have been replaced district-wide during the past few weeks. Filters will, be con will continue to be changed per the appropriate schedules throughout the district. Cleaning standards. In March of this year, the district and its custodial supply company representative conducted a district-wide training of site custodians on proper cleaning, sanitation, and disinfection procedures. This, also covered, this training also covered the proper use of chemicals as well as the district's standardization on cleaning chemicals. Additional training sessions will be held prior to the beginning of school and throughout the school year. And in addition to all of the uh, PPE that's been purchased by the district, mentioned by Mrs. Fellows, uh, the district has also stocked up on the cleaning supplies and sanitizers. Those are being distributed to the school sites. Moving on to the next slide, preventive procedures in transportation. Safety. Bus drivers will conduct temperature checks using a no-touch thermometer prior to boarding students. 
Hand sanitizer will be provided on all buses and students must sanitize their hands upon boarding and exiting the bus. Students and drivers will be required to wear face masks while on the bus and we will have extra masks available for any student who arrives without one. Weather permitting, bus drivers will keep windows open on the buses for ventilation. Physical distancing. We will be implementing a seating plan to maximize physical distancing between passengers. This plan could be every other seat, cross seating vacancies, one passenger per seat, et cetera, and or a combination of all of these. When loading the bus, passengers will be required to fill rear seats first and load forward to the front of the bus. When parking, the bus will be emptied front to back. This process will ensure less contact between each passenger. And lastly, cleaning of our buses. High touch surfaces on every bus will be cleaned, sanitized, and disinfected by the driver after each student drop off and at the end of each day. Next slide, please. Facilities use and user groups. Since the beginning of the school closures in March, our school facilities have been closed to outside user groups. In alignment with the state of California's reopening suggestions and guidelines, we've recently approved the reopening of facilities to those groups that provide childcare services, namely the YMCA at Borba Elementary and the city of Chino at the Cal Arrow Preserve Community Center. Both groups will begin their programs in early July. With limited custodial resources and cleaning chemicals, the district cannot commit to reopening sites to further use until we reopen in stage four. That's it from facilities and planning, facilities planning and operations, and I'll now hand it off to Rich Rideout and Human Resources. Thank you. Good evening. Next slide, please. Visitors and community stakeholders are an integral aspect to supporting our schools. In this slide, you will see that visitors will start being allowed on school sites in stage three. Visitor, visitors will be primarily allowed at this stage to continue critical structures such as school governance. These are like booster clubs, school site councils, and ELAC. To do this at stage three, visitors will be screened prior to entrance. This will include both passive and active screening. They will have their temperature and answer screening questions. They will be required to have face coverings. They will also have expectations for practice on site to be re reviewed with them prior to coming on site. This is things like knowing to avoid using another person's workstation, washing hands frequently, when and where they should be supporting. Lastly, they will be expected to hand sanitize prior to coming on to the school site through either washing their hands or utilizing hand sanitizer. Before leaving the school site, they will also be requested to use hand sanitizer again. We know that working with our great visitors and stakeholders, that we will continue to demonstrate a safe school environment for our students. And with that, I turn it over to Mrs. Sandra Chen. We understand that a successful nutrition program is a key component to every educational environment. Our district has guidelines in place to ensure that students participating in all learning models have access to healthy meals. On the staff side, our nutrition services staff have been and will continue to follow all health and hygiene protocols, including the proper use of face coverings and gloves and keeping an adequate distance apart wherever possible. Staff will continue to follow strict operating procedures during meal preparation, meal service, and sanitization of school kitchens to promote physical distancing and contactless meal delivery where possible, staff will continue to prepare and serve individually packaged meals to students instead of the self-service uh, buffet style. Staff will use disposable trays and containers to hold all food products. Additionally, staff will follow health and safety protocols by cleaning, sanitizing, and disinfecting their workstations and frequently touched surfaces. On the student side, students must wash or sanitize their hands before meal service. Students are also recommended to wear face coverings while they wait in line for their food. Lunch periods may be staggered to allow for cleaning between meal services and to serve students in smaller groups. There will be floor markings and signages on walls to ensure 
that students remain adequately spaced apart while waiting for food and seating. Additionally, nutrition services staff will be working closely with school site administration and identify additional access points for providing meal service, as well as additional areas on campus for meal consumption. This may include both indoors and outdoor seating areas. And with that, I hand it back to Dr. Enfield. All right, looking at uh, communications, we are gonna continue uh, to provide our parents and community with information uh, by sending out messages through our ARI system and we'll use the different social media platforms along with continuously school messenger. Uh, and also we have on our district website, a COVID-19 page and we'll continue to update that and provide information. Also in conjunction with that, our family engagement center will be providing uh, trainings for our parents focusing on uh, COVID-19 preventive measures, helping in reducing the spread of COVID-19, wellness training, uh, social emotional training, and also they'll be working with uh, helping our, our communities and parents enroll with ARIES because that's an important form of communication for our district. And so they'll work on getting accounts and logins with our, our parents. Um, another component of that is uh, we wanted to, uh, the surveys that are going out to parents, again, I want to touch on that. Um, we'll be uh, sending our first survey out tomorrow, starting tomorrow, and it will close on June 24th. Uh, this survey is to provide the district with the data to, for the plans for the learning options. Uh, the second survey, like I said, will go out on the second or third week of July. This survey will be the final survey for parents to commit to the learning options for each of their, each, each kid that they have in the household. So again, fill out one survey for, for each child. Uh, with that, again, we're gonna do the best to our ability based on the state's flexibility of providing the different options uh, for our parents. Because uh, when you looked at the different models and how we're looking at opening up, um, you know, a parent may be looking at this presentation and saying, well, it looks like if we're in stage three, you're offering blended or traditional schools. Well, that's not the case. You're gonna have that option. If you don't want your child to, to attend and you want to do that distance learning, that's an option you can go ahead and select in that survey. Um, those, the, the stages are what we're opening up as the state allows us, but we're giving parents those options to choose from those. Also, if we were in stage, let's say stage one or stage 2A, those options in, 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 in blended learning or traditional would not be allowed if we are in stage one or stage two. Those would only be allowed if we, the county has opened up into stage three and only allowed, we're not making that determination on our own. We would contact the county health department and say, hey, we're in, I know you've just moved to stage three and based on the information, do you think it would be appropriate for us to make that move? Because our, we have a large county. Uh, geographically, it's the largest uh, county, I believe in the United States. And so you may have hot spots in different parts of the county. And, the, and that's what the county health department uh, shared with us. And they told us to work with them to contact them if you're going to start to open up uh, your schools and if you're opening up uh, different different models to reach out to them to see are there some hot spots in the community because they may say no we want you to 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 wait a little bit before we would even move into another uh, another model of bringing kids back and so that piece we're going to continue to uh, uh, stay in contact with our county health department as we do that uh, looking at the preventive training, this is a uh, critical component of this. This is one that we need everybody's support, um, everybody's support in doing that passive uh, assessment of looking at the signs of, of COVID-19. Um, you know, I've gotten into the habit that several times a day I take my temperature. Um, you know, if I have any uh, symptoms or feel like that, we're asking our employees to stay home. We're going to ask our students to stay home. Parents do that, that monitoring, that passive uh, checking in on your kids, taking their temperature before you would send them to school. If they have a cough, please hold them home. Uh, we're asking people to be very cautious. We're suspending our perfect attendance awards uh, for the 2020-21 school year. This is, uh, this is a year that we want people to be very sensitive to that. 
Uh, we're going to continue to look at the different trainings that we provide to our staff, the uh, trainings that we provide to our students regarding hand washing and, and hygiene of taking care of themselves. Uh, so that's going to be a, a, an important piece of that preventive training. And then the last piece, which I discussed uh, a little bit ago, bit, bit ago, was the coordination of services that we used a number of different documents in creating our, our plan for reopening. And again, I think it's that uh, the, the, the sharing of ideas uh, with other districts across the state of looking at uh, the possible ways of re reopening, looking at the plans and the guidelines and in all of the, the different documents that are out there to, to come up with a plan uh, for our, our district. And again, uh, as part of that, we thought it was in, important to really uh, give our parents that option to select uh, through the surveys, the two surveys that will be coming out. And so with that, um, I, we're done with the presentation and I will turn it now back over to the board president, Mr. Schaefer, uh, to see if the board has any questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Enfield and cabinet for all of the information. And uh, I know it took uh, countless hours getting all this together. So thank you very much for your dedication and for getting all this information together for us this evening. Um, before I go to the board for questions, I would just like to remind the board um, and community that may be watching the, tonight's meeting that this is a study session for discussion purposes only. Um, and we will be not be making any taking any definitive action tonight. Um, this was simply uh, meant for us to be able to receive information from staff uh, in a public setting as required and to give us uh, the opportunity to ask questions on that information. Uh, Dr. Enfield, is it possible to go back to um, a board so I can see the board members? Thank you. Uh, with that, I will open this up to any board members that might have questions. Ms. Gagne, please. Yes, so I understand uh, pairing up our stages to the stages that the county uh, will be taking. Uh, unfortunately, we've seen this here at the state level as well as at the county level that there's been immense political pressure to move and advance through these stages. Um, so whereas things were laid out a couple months ago and they weren't particular stages, now we're throwing nail salons, things just seem to be batted back and forth without any real public health consideration as to whether or not things should be reopening. Uh, additionally, we saw over the last weekend, we had the highest two day peak in San Bernardino County of new COVID-19 cases. Um, and one might posit that that's because we have loosened restrictions uh, over the last couple of weeks, um, particularly around the Memorial Day holiday, we're now starting to see the after effects of that. Um, so bearing that in mind that, you know, we have a commitment to students, we have a commitment to our staff, we have a commitment to the community, um, and we're not necessarily in the same position as our other elected officials who might feel that immense pressure. We have a responsibility to children and maybe they aren't thinking about that. They're thinking about the next election. Um, you know, how are we going to make these decisions if we do not feel the county is making prudent decisions um, that are really thinking about students? That's the first part of my question because, and I appreciate we have at the county level officials that are trying to make prudent decisions, um, but as we can all see, um, there's a lot of pressure on both sides uh, with COVID-19 and safety measures. Secondary to that, um, in moving from stage to stage, um, so if we either one, there's a government order that mandates us having to go immediately back to blended learning and or distance learning completely, um, or we have a campus site where a case of COVID arises, whether it's a student on campus or a parent of a student um, that necessitates uh, what Mrs. Fellows outlined, which is several day maybe a couple week periods of closing down a campus and working with public health, how are we going to be set up to accommodate that transition? And I ask that specifically because a lot of the communication I've been receiving from the community at all socioeconomic levels is about equity and learning. Um, and not all households are prepared to support students at home with distance learning. There's language issues, education issues. Uh, we have, we're a commuter community. We have parents that need to go back to work. And as these stages advance, they'll be forced to go back to work. So what are we doing to make sure that if we do have to transition back and forth, that we're able to do that 
And then are we going to be willing to make a commitment that if public health because they're responsible to the board of supervisors, they might take cues from the state is not making the right decision for our students and our community. You know, are we gonna to commit to, you know, making those right decisions based off our community? Let me, let me catch on the, the, the first part of your question of when we open up into a stage. So let's say, let's say we were in, we're in stage 2B right now when we moved to stage three and school was in, in process. That doesn't mean today, because I'm in stage three, that we're moving to traditional. Let's say we're in the blended model. From our perspective, we're gonna stay in that more conservative blended model for a while to look at the data that's coming in because what the county is providing to us is providing the number of cases uh, in our cities, um, in uh, Chino, Chino Hills, and Ontario. They're also tracking the number of cases by students uh, um, well, I'm not going to um, kids under the age of 18, I believe it is. I have to go back and check. And so they, they send that weekly report to us. And so that's information we would be looking at to see, are those numbers going up? Are they going down? Uh, where are we within this? Um, and then talking with that county of, hey, it looks like our numbers are going down, or they've been staying consistent with that. What do you think with the health department of, of opening or not opening? But again, it's not something we're planning. Oh, we're there, so let's open up day one. Uh, it's a, uh, it gives us that flexibility. And I think we're gonna be more cautious as we move into those different stages. Um, the, the second part of your question is what do we have in place? I'm gonna ask Dr. Park because she's the one who's been working on the, uh, the, the, the learning options, but that's part of the plan because part of our plan is we have to be realistic. Uh, we have a large district and if we open back up and we have some type of, let's say we're in a blended learning, uh, we're gonna have to have that expectation that somebody's gonna come down with COVID-19 in our district. And what are those backup plans and what are we going to do? We didn't go into all of that, into that major detail tonight, but those are the things that we continuously are building and improving upon because we're trying to make, don't turn a single stone unturned because we have to have everything in place because we're preparing for all of those different things to happen. Mm -hmm. So with that, please, if, because as you said, Ms. Gagne, we could get a call right now if our schools were open and say, hey, there's a case of COVID-19 at a school site, and then we have to go back and figure out what is it that we're going to put in place? Who do we communicate? What's the process? What are we going to do? All of that we're, we're, we're working on, and we have a lot of that done. But the learning part, let me have Dr. Park touch base on that. So the, depending on the circumstances we may be faced with, and we didn't go into the intricacies of all of the details today, but we do have contingency plans to scale up, to scale down to any learning continuum of options. So we are prepared uh, to do that. Secondly, our Family Engagement Center has been critical in the training of families. We've also established a hotline a, a tutoring hotline to support families. And in our effort to bring a 2.0 version in, whether it's distance learning or through blended, we will be offering more support to our families, not only with trainings, but we have also been, um, we've also been working on videos and have been setting up individual Zoom, Zoom meetings along with phone calls with individual families to also offer assistance. We also have a technology hotline to assist students and families during the day to provide tech support as part of the learning as well. Thank you. Any other board members with questions? Mr. Knopf. Yeah, I just have a comment. So I'd like to thank all the staffs and, and, and Dr. Enfield. Uh, this was a great board study lesson. Um, yes, uh, the key is flexibility. We need to be flexible and be ready for, for curveballs. Um, I'd like to thank our staffs for well thought out plan where pre-screening was a very important issue for our students, staffs and volunteers and parents. And also tracing infections and should infections do occur 
how we're going to shut it down. So that's very important for all of us. So thank you for that. And um, also giving an options for our parents for learning options. So that's very critical for our parents' mind. So good job guys. And thank you for uh, excellent work. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Na. Mr. Cruz, do you have any comments or questions? Yeah, just a um, comment and question. And that is, you know, the heart of this plan is, is so critical. Families, it's so integral part of this plan here. And, um, you know, there's been um, some results, you know, concerning re results that are, that are high. Let me read you some. Parents are concerned they do not have resources or supplies to help their child stay academically on track. Parents reported receiving little to no information about academic or other resources from their school or district. For parents who did receive academic resources, students in low-income households were less likely to receive science instructional materials. 25% um, of non-English home speakers say their child's school has not provided materials in other languages. 89% um, are concerned that their children will fall behind academically. 80% report a higher than unusual level of stress due to school closures. 84% of parents of low-income households are concerned about being able to provide financially for their families compared to 72% um, of higher incomes. You know, questions like child care, grandparents involved. It, it is so essential that when it comes to families, you know, reaching out families, that we do need to expand the Family Engagement Center. We do need to communicate and educate effectively for, for our families because this, this whole thing is key on families and um you know we have to do we have to do the very best to reach out you know for this to be very effective thank you thank you mr cruz uh dr infield first before we move forward i know miss hernandez had to leave early if we could make sure we ascertain what time she signed off so we can accurately reflect that in the minutes okay um I too would like to thank you guys for all the work that you did. And I think it's uh, of paramount importance that we provide choices. And so I'm glad to see that as we're moving forward uh, to implementation of some of these things that um, a key component of this is parental choice for uh, whether they want to do distance learning or in-class learning as we, as we move towards that. So uh, I wanna uh, stress that I, I think that's extremely important that we continue to offer that as we move forward. Um, and, and looking at the parent surveys, uh, I may have missed this. Can you tell me how are we pushing that out um, to the community to, to ensure that we get the highest participation possible? Grace, do you want to cover that? Sure. It will be sent out to it will be sent out through Aries Communication. Along with that, it will be posted on the district website and on every school website, and each principal at every school will also use their school Aries communication to message out to their own community about the importance of taking this interest survey. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, Dr. Infield, I had a few questions also related to, to Boys Republic. Um, you, you covered it fairly extensively. I had a couple of concerns though that I would like to uh, see if we can look into. Uh, the one is um, since these are, for the most part, um, court uh, appointed, the, the students there are, are placed there by court. Um, I'd like to know what uh, BR's process is when a new student or a new uh, young man is placed there. Um, are they going through a social isolating period? What What is their process to ensure that um, that that's being taken care of properly. Um, the other the other concern that I have is it's not just our staff that's in contact with these young men. It's also a BR staff, and we really have no way of knowing um, on their weekends what. And it's none of our business, quite frankly, what their social isolation or social distancing uh, procedures are in their own life, and and that concerns me a little bit um, because those staff members, along with our staff members, are going to be uh, interacting with those young men. Uh, and so I'm, I, I am concerned about that. Um, 
the other, I guess the other concern that I have is we've laid out the stages, we're implementing um, certain learning um, methods at, at certain opening uh, stages where the county's at. But for this, for this campus, it seems like we've just thrown that to the wayside and we're kind of going against our own um, pr uh, procedure or our own um, reopening plan, so to speak, and starting up uh, with these young men um, in person right away. And, and we're not doing it with Cal Aero. And I understand Cal Aero has probably, you know, 50 times more students. But the, the point is, I think there needs to be, we need to show some consistency across the board with this plan, number one. And number two, make sure that we're taking all of these concerns into account. Um, uh, unless we're under some legal requirement um, by the state or by the courts to provide um, in-person learning sooner than later because they are um, wards of the court, um, I, I would like to see us look at some other options as we move forward um, with Boys Republic. Okay. Um, as, as far as our PPE, is there, are we eligible for, is there any available local, state, federal funding specifically related to PPE expenses? Sandra, do you know? Yes, uh, there's actually some relief funds coming from the state for that, as well as the, the federal government under the CARES Act. Okay. And do, have we qualified for that, do we know, or is that still something pending? Oh, no, no, no. The, the portion that's coming from the state, we have already received. Okay. Dr. Enfield, to your knowledge, is any other district in our county, and I'm, I'm specifically talking about San Bernardino County, have any of them committed to a full return um, for the 2021 school year at the beginning? Or is, are they all looking at what we're looking at doing some type of distance learning or, or hybrid learning? I, I, I know in our county there, I think there, and, and I don't want to I don't know if they've announced it. I know in my conversations, I know there were a couple of districts that were looking at full coming back completely, um, but I don't know if that's been announced. So I won't share any Absolutely. any names on okay. that. Um, but I do, I, I do believe a a, a majority. Uh, a, well, I, I I believe a lot of schools are looking at basically what we're doing, looking okay. at that blended learning of coming back into the blending and then determining when do they transition into the traditional uh, and giving some options on that independent um, okay. independent model. I, I, I think that's about where most of them are. Uh, there may be some that, um, uh, yeah, I think that's where they most of them are. Okay. And with, on, on to a different topic, without divulging any information um, as far as our bargaining and negotiations, um, MOUs with our uh, two employee groups. Um, the biggest concern or the biggest complaint I heard about distance learning, I know we were we were thrust into it and we got it up and running as quick as we could. And I think we did a very, very good job uh, under the circumstances. But one of the concerns that I heard from several parents, and I actually you know, witnessed this myself with my daughter um, at her junior high, is some of the teachers were really good about doing online lessons and meetings and follow up and others kind of threw up an assignment on Monday and said, turn it in on Friday. And we didn't see anything of them in between there. And I'm not trying to, I'm not disparaging anybody. I'm not knocking anybody, but can you provide us with a little bit of background on what some of the accountability steps are going to be if we go to um, distance learning only at the beginning or even a hybrid what what kind of things do we have in place that are gonna are we gonna have for accountability? Uh, Dr. Park, do you want to go over that because that's that's your area that you've worked on, and I may touch a little bit at the end. So I'll start with distance learning. Um, earlier in the presentation, we shared that it will be an expectation to have daily synchronous instruction where there's face to face time through district supported platforms, which is. Google Classroom and also Microsoft Teams. And they are district, they are district supported platforms. So administrators can go in and out of any of these okay. virtual classrooms. Okay. So daily we'll have face-to-face -face time. They won't be pre-recorded videos, but daily 
teachers will be checking in and providing live instruction with their students. Okay, great. And uh, somebody had mentioned, I think in one of uh, our community letters about live streaming for those students that might not be in the classroom once we go to a hybrid model. Um, if we're at a hybrid model, will they not be getting the same instruction while they're in the classroom? So live streaming, it would be a little bit re redundant for them. So at this time with our blended learning model, we do not have plans to live stream the instruction. So the students would physically intend in class instruction. And then on the day they are rotating out, there may be some virtual online instruction, but it will mostly be in, in independent work an extension of the learning that they received um, from the day that they were in seat. Okay, thank you. I think another issue on that, Mr. Schaefer, is when you're when we're that's why that first survey out to parents is important data for us because um, ACT did a survey and I'm very appreciative of that survey of what the teachers were looking at. Um, and, and we would need to look at staffing those different programs. So it, it, it may not make sense, even though I, I'm willing to live stream in my room to somebody at home, it may make more sense for that, that, that person at home to be in this other program and staffing it with the teacher. Because there are staffing ratios that we still need to follow within that in the, in the contractual pieces that we're trying to adhere to. Okay. Uh, and it's also that flexibility with our associations. Okay, perfect. Uh, then I think one of the last other questions that I have um, has to do with outside groups and district facilities. I look like, uh, if I remember correctly, that was in what the county would consider stage four. Um, I just want to make clear that we're not going to make any of the district facilities available to the public before they're available to our students. That That is correct. Um, we're looking at that. And, and you know, I it's a difficult one because I know there's communities that, that want to use the facilities, but for us, it's an issue of manpower and cleaning disinfectants that we do not want to run short on because we're using it for outside groups. And, and then when we're cleaning those facilities and disinfecting them with our supplies, that's our, our can be difficult to get. I, I mean, we're, we got 55 gallon drums, but we're ensuring that we have that supply to take care of our, our, our students here in that disinfecting that we're also pulling manpower away potentially that we need in our facilities cleaning other areas um, and so th that right now is not a priority for us as a district is the educational component uh, and opening our programs internally is 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 our first priority okay perfect uh, I think that's all I have at the moment are there uh, any follow-up questions from uh, remaining or mrs. Gagne uh, yes, so I actually have a quick question. I have a pretty healthy list of questions. So uh, President Schaefer, I don't know if I want to defer to other board members if they have questions, but I got quite a list here. So uh, how would you like me to proceed? Well, why don't we go through a couple of them and then we'll take a break and see if anybody wants to jump in and then we'll go back. Great, thank you. Um, so my first question is around setting rules and enforcement. Um, clearly in reading um, the background materials and plan you provided to the board, we're going to be asking both students, staff and visitors to do certain things, whether that's get their temperature checked, uh, take a survey for symptoms, wear a mask. Um, and clearly, as you can just take the temperature, no pun intended of what's going on in America and in our communities, some people are clearly okay with these things and other people feel like they're overreach. Um, in setting these rules, how are we going to enforce these rules and who are we basically deputizing both the district office as well as the campuses to enforce those rules? Well, we would hope that when the public comes in, just as when I go into a restaurant um, or I go into a mall or any, any outside business, if they ask me to put on a mask, I, I respect that, that I'm going into that. In, in our school sites, we're gonna ask our, our parents, our community, even if they're opposed to a mask, you're entering our facilities, please wear the mask. Um, I think our, our, our administration, our office staff will, will ask any community coming up. We have signs posted, we're asking them to, to follow that. If, it, if it's fundamentally they can't, then we would ask, can you just make a phone call then and, and call into the office and can we, we help you in, in that sense? And, I, and I'm hoping and I believe that our community will, 
support us in, in that piece of it. Our students, we're gonna highly encourage that our students wear that, but in the guidelines, they're not a mandated. Um, again, we're gonna highly encourage that. We would hope that our students wear that, but we also understand there are some students that there, there are health issues regarding masks that, that they just basically cannot uh, wear them. And we under, understand that completely. Um, and then we understand that there are some people that just will, will not wear them. So for the kids, we're, we're, we're gonna highly encourage that. Uh, for staff, the, the expectation is that staff is wearing the mask. Uh, again, if they're not wearing it, it's gonna be up to that administrator, whether it's a department or whether it's a school site to follow up with staff members that aren't following those guidelines. Um, but it's, a, it's an important one for us. We have the signs up and that we have to, when we're here, follow that. I know a lot of times, like right now I'm at, I'm at work, I'm sitting in my office, nobody's in here, so I don't have a, a mask on. So some of us are fortunate enough that they do have areas in, that you can get to where they can take it off because people aren't around, but other people aren't as fortunate enough and it's gonna have to, they're gonna have to wear those to, uh, to protect everybody. But it, it does fall onto administration to ultimately enforce that, but it's also gonna take the, uh, the community, meaning not just, the internal community of all of us working together to enforce that because there is, um, I, I'll tell you, I was at Orange County and at the beaches this last weekend and I, I, I very few people uh, had a mask on when I was there. So um, I, I know that out there, there's a lot of people that don't wear them and there are a lot of people that do. And what are we going to do to further assist um, and support our special education students? I think there's a lot of concern from parents in the community and teachers in our district that clearly some of these requirements and public health guidelines um, may, may work well for me, but they're not working well for our special education students, their teachers and families. Um, what are we going to do uh, in and out of our classrooms to support those students? I, I'll let Leia fellas um, talk about that. So each individual student, of course, as you know, with special ed, they have an IEP. In addition, they could have a health care plan. So based on that health care plan, that's, that is what we would invoke and follow for those students because each one of those students have different needs. Great. Um, let me also touch on that too. I mean, we're, we're going to also look at... Um, and, and again, I know this goes back a little bit with our um, with, with Boys Republic, but typically our special ed classrooms are much smaller than our uh, regular classrooms. And so we are looking at, can we get um, some of those classrooms back here? Uh, you know, for parents who wanna come back, can we get the majority of those students back into our, our classrooms, our, our special day classes? So we're looking at that possibility because those, those classrooms, not all of them, but some of them have a significant lower number of students in, and where you can have that social distancing in the classrooms. But again, some of them have health needs where they can't wear a mask. And so those are all gonna be issues that we're, we're looking at of, of trying to, to, to get our students uh, back here in those programs. Um, and in terms of substitute teachers, this is a two-part question. Uh, one is just to training and the availability of training in our district's policies and supporting them on our campuses. But two, many of our substitute teachers vacillate from district to district. And uh, unfortunately, um, we're not all gonna be consistent. Riverside County, San Bernardino County, Orange and LA all about one another. So you could go 10 miles and a school district's gonna have a completely different ecosystem for how they're handling this. Um, how are we gonna manage our substitutes given that they could be in one environment one day and in ours the next? Uh, again, we're gonna, HR I know will do the, the training that they're doing with our current employees of doing that wellness, taking a thermometer, checking, we'll be doing checks uh, when they report to check on their, their temperatures. The other thing that we're doing and hopefully gonna reduce the number of uh, substitutes is we're putting a hold on our district-wide professional development for 2020-21. Um, a big component of that because our PD does, uh, does take a, uh, require us to use a lot of substitute. Um, because of everything that's going on and trying to plan those PDs and the potential that, that would be going, we just said, you know what, this is a year that we're just gonna basically stay status quo on our district-wide PDs. So that should help, help reduce the number of substitutes district-wide significantly. Um, 
And then with that, we're going to ask the school sites to continue the PD that we're looking at, but they're going to have to do it on a much smaller scale at their, their school sites to focus in on those critical things that we've been working on for a couple of years because we still want to continue with that. Uh, but that's another area that we're going to reduce substitutes on. Um, and are we foreseeing any supply chain related issues? I think we all uh, saw the toilet paper and paper towel rush of, of March and April, um, and I don't mean to make light of it, but I think that should the situation become serious once again, I mean, it still is serious, but should it, should it progress even further, um, there was difficulty in getting supplies, hand sanitizer, paper towels, other things that we would need to have you know, on our campuses. Um, are we foreseeing any difficulties with supply chain acquisition or do we feel that we're on the right trajectory? Well, I'll let Greg follow up on that, but that's why in that first part, when I talked in the safety of making sure that we had plenty of supplies, I meant I, I don't want supplies for, oh, we got supplies for three months. I meant I wanna make sure that we have masks. If, if we have them, do we have them for six months, You know, half the year? Um, we want to make sure that we have uh, ample stock in, in stock so that we don't even run the chance of running out if we transition and start to bring kids back. Uh, because I, I, the last thing I want to do is, oh, we need to close because now we don't have the supplies. I want to make sure that we have them and that the supply chain is moving. And so I'll let Greg finish up uh, on that piece of it. Sure. Yes, early on, um, there were numerous shortages of anything and everything related to um, cleaning and sanitization of uh, school facilities, as well as the PPE, uh, masks and gloves and face shields and everything. But um, to date, everything that we've ordered, um, we have gotten a portion of it, if not all of it. And we are expecting the, the balance of what we've ordered to come in within the next few weeks. Um, once we have that, we will um, get it cataloged. We will have it available for, um, for the sites to ordering through our district warehouse. But you know, we can't just rely on what we've got. We've also got to order enough to keep us going well into the year. So um, we're in that step right now for the, the next round of orders. Great, thank you. And my understanding is we're trying to keep students in the same classrooms as much as possible, which is quite easier at the elementary level than at the uh, 7th through 12th grade level. When we do transition back to blended learning uh, and or a more traditional model, um, you know, what changes are we going to have to make on our junior high and high school campuses? Um, there's just there's a fluid nature of those campuses due to the, the electives that students take, interest levels, et cetera. So I'm just curious, um, you know, how that will look for students. Dr. Park. Hey. So Ms. Gagne, it is much easier at an elementary school and at a junior high and high school, we recognize it's going to be difficult. Other than in addition to reducing those class sizes, we will work diligently on the cleaning and sanitization of those classrooms. Thank you. Um, and do we have any systems set up yet or have we given um, thought to if we're going to use technology um, or some other system in terms of contact tracing? Um, you know, just the reality of our schools are we could have a thousand students on a campus, but the multiplier with parents, community members and everything else is so much greater. Um, you know, are we going to be employing any technology to do that or, you know, what's our process going to be? So public health is responsible for the contact tracing. The school site will be the ones who will be responsible for talking to the students initially and um, attempt to do contract tracing there. Right now it's paper pencil. However, uh, the team is working on making it more efficient because as you said, there can be from just a few kids to multiple um, amounts of students. So that is something that the group is still working on. Great, thank you. Um, and in terms of the uh, alternate learning options, so um, one of the slides referenced um, the option for independent study in K through eight, uh, the option of our pre-existing virtual program um, out of our alternative education center for grades seven through 12. Um, would you mind just providing a little bit more description of those programs? I ask this because I received many communications where I think parents, their immediate reaction, just not knowing what we were going to present was, I'm going to homeschool if we have to go back. 
Um, I want our parents, I want our children to be though integrated into our school district as much as possible if parents do want to exercise parental choice and keep their kids out to a vaccine or however they're comfortable from a health perspective. So if we could provide a little bit of explanation, that would be, that'd be great. Sure. So the three different learning options that we provided, which were traditional instruction, learning, distance learning 2.0 and blended would be an offering we would provide consistently across all schools. And so at the time, if a parent was not comfortable with, let's say, blended learning that we would be offering, then they would choose to participate in distance learning, which may be um, housed at their site or it may be housed at our alternative education center. So at this time, not knowing the interest with our families, it's, it's difficult to plan where the other learning option, the other learning options are all going to be situated. Um, but at the alternative education center, we will certainly offer virtual instruction which is through online curriculum that we already have, and it's actually designed for independent learners. And we will also offer through our Alternative Education Center, our home-based independent study program. So what's in flux right now is if we were to offer distance learning for kindergarten through our eight students, would that be housed at the school or at the Alternative Education Center? And, and, and I think that's why for the, the first survey will help us when we communicate out into the second survey for parents to choose that we'll have more data for them regarding that because that, that first survey is really critical. That's why we're asking the parents to give us that so we can look and see what that interest is and then we can build out that program uh, most effectively for our kids so that it really is at the level that they, that they want. Um, that's why I know a lot of districts are just doing one survey. They did one and then they're done. We wanna see where is that interest and then based on that, we can build that out and then be very clear in the second survey that when you select this option, this is what that program is. It gives us that ability to add more data for our parents. Um, and in our communities, um, we unfortunately have many families who are on the other side of the digital divide. Um, and I know just in speaking to teachers and other parents, you know, they were aware that some of these families, despite our best efforts, um, you know, just weren't as plugged in or engaged. Um, in terms of just having to have students ready to transition back and forth through our models, um, you know, what are we doing in terms of device distribution, uh, continued hotspots? I think initially it was easier to say, we're gonna be doing this distance learning for a couple months and accommodate that. But what are we doing long-term to make sure that one, our students have devices, two, um, thank you, you outlined earlier, the support for those devices, but also continuity of internet. Well, we, we, we were able to deploy everybody that needed a device. We were able to deploy that. And, and we've actually uh, purchased a, uh, we took all of our budgets here at the end of the year and combined them, all of our departments to, to purchase more Chromebooks district-wide to ensure that we had, had enough. And so uh, they all came back in. I, I meant they came back in pr pretty much in, in good shape and everything. Uh, so there is plenty uh, supply. We have all the hotspots that we bought. We still own all those. We did not use them all up. So we still have those available. You know, we can turn them off and turn them back on. So those are all turned off and, and we have them ready to deploy uh, at a moment's notice. I think we're in a much better position than the first time around. And, and so um, the, 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 the technology is there for, for our district. Um, and in terms of mental health services, uh, this clearly has been um, unprecedented, but a very jarring time for many of our students, um, both in transitioning from this quarantine uh, stay at home reality back to campus, but also should we need to stay in a, a distance model for longer than initially expected? Um, you know, what is our provision of mental health services for students going to look like in these new models? So I want to address that um, our team is working on providing a plan. So for instance, we will have actual, our counselors provide guidance lessons um, 
through distance learning if we continue through distance learning and or blended uh, and or through the blended model. In addition, um, the second step curriculum we use for K-8, we're looking at a scope and sequence review to ensure that we are going to hit the needed uh, stressors such as coping mechanisms, fear, um, to help our students. Additionally, we're going to have a wellness phone line to help with referrals and or support for families that call in. And in addition to that, through our uh, uh, team under the ERMS program, we will su uh, provide support to our students and families as well. Great, thank you, that's it. Mr. Na, I think. Mr. Na, real quick, I'm gonna, just a follow up to that last question, uh, okay. if you don't mind. Uh, since it's uh, contemporaneous to uh, what Mrs. Gagne was asking, uh, Dr. Enfield or, or Cabinet, um, are we continuing to still offer uh, counseling through the city of Chino also through community services? Yes, we actually renewed our contract, Mr. Schaefer. So that's scheduled for the 2020-21 school year. Okay, thank you. And, and the referrals will still be made uh, on an as needed basis? Correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Knopf, please. Okay. Yeah, uh, we have a good relationship with our police departments. So um, should something happen surrounding our school campus, we'll be notified by the police department and we would act accordingly to protect our children. And I believe at this time, we need to build a strong relationship with public health department. So should we find hotspots or outbreaks uh, surrounding our schools, certain areas, that where we could be notified and, and um, take some assertions, uh, pre-screening or, or uh, tracing uh, infections, possible infections and um, prevent our children being harmed. Yeah, they, they, they provide that, that data. I think it's a weekly data, Mr. Na, with us with the, the, the number of uh, active cases in all the cities throughout San Bernardino County. Um, so they are providing that information for us. And again, uh, if, if we get on the phone and, and call them, they'll provide us uh, information, you know, other information. Uh, and we're on the phone. I, I met Ms. Fellows and, and her staff is constantly uh, contacting them for a variety of different things. And, and they've been very responsive for us. Great. Thank you. That's it. Uh, I have a couple of follow up questions. Mr. Cruz, do you have anything additional? Yes, I do. Go ahead. Um, you know, we have to be, when it comes to our teachers, we've got to be really sensitive about what they're going through. And, um, you know, Dr. Grace, you know, when, you know, traditionally they're doing instruction, that's what they've been taught. Then all of a sudden you go into this distance learning and you know that there's anxiety, there's maybe even scary, even the confidence. There is a learning curve when it comes to distance learning. And um, when you look, look at this, you know, it's almost like two preps, you know, you know, if we go to hybrid or distance, our teachers, they need time to prepare lessons, you know, lessons and in, 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 in how yeah, to set up the self formative and assessments and, and like you, you mentioned differentiated instruction for ELLs, tier two and three special ed and communicating with parents too, because because not, not only the kids are there in distance learning, but the parents are watching too. And, you know, let's face it, we have to get used to this. Uh, the, you know, so this, this has to be a big, when it comes to giving time for our teachers, at least two or three weeks to prepare, it is gonna be so essential. So, and also another thing too, you know, you know for the TK, that comment that I heard, TK through second, you know, there's been studies that they don't do well sitting using a computer. So, um, you know, obviously that, that we need to think about that too. And I'll stop from there. I have a couple of questions, but I want you, what do you think, Dr. Grace? Yes, to do anything well, time is certainly something you have to plan for along with professional learning for, for staff. You are, you are correct. And, um, 
the, the instructional spans of what students can handle is a definite consideration that we have planned for as well. So depending on the grade level, um, we know that in a TK class, their attention span and what they can do during a time period is gonna be very different than what an eighth grader might be able to accomplish. So in our learning options and our learning designs that we did not go over today, that is something that we did account for. And also Dr. Grace, or may maybe anybody could tell me, was there a survey given to teachers about what was their preference of this, the options, how to open up the school? Yes, ACT uh, provided a survey to their teachers. And what was their outcome? What, what did the, do they, do they want a distance learning? What was, does anybody know anything about that? I guess, no? <laughs> yeah, I, I'd have to pull it up, um, Mr. Cruz, to, to take a look at it, uh, cause I don't want to misquote anything on there. Um, you know, the, the, the surveys, it pretty much lined Put it this way, a number of districts have gone out with surveys. And when we look at those surveys from uh, probably, I, I'm gonna guesstimate probably at least 10 to 15 different districts that have done surveys, they've all been pretty consistent around 60 to 70% who have wanted to come back to school full-time with every mm -hmm. single day. Um, and then I think most of those surveys have been around 10 to, I don't think as high as 20%, but let me just say between 10 and 20% who wanted to stay around that distance learning and then the rest kind of in that blended model. Um, that's what, when we look at all the different districts because they've done their surveys, they put that information out. And when we look at them, they're, they're somewhere in, in that area. Um, okay. I think when we looked at the teacher survey, it kind of fell, if I'm correct, Dr. Park, somewhere in that same, same area. I'm not gonna say it was exactly like that, but there was a lot of similarities that, that looked like the uh, parent surveys on the different choices that other districts have put out there. Okay. Let me ask you uh, another question, Dr. Enfield. Um, you, you, may, you may have answered it, but I just, just review. Now, the JAMA on March 40th, 2020, they stated that, that, that N95 respirators cannot be used by individuals with facial hair or by children because it's difficult to achieve a proper fit. So if we go to a hybrid in elementary, uh, they, they'll have options to wear a mask or, or, we're, or we're going to like, you've got to wear your mask. Well, again, for our students, we're highly encouraging them to wear the mask. When we look at the guidelines that have come out, that's one of the, the guidelines in there. They're, they're, they're not mandating it, uh, but they're highly encouraging that all students wear a mask. Um, and so that's, that will be, that's what we're going to encourage. Now, the, the one piece on there is the mask will be required when you get onto the, the bus because of the distancing within that, um, it's gonna be very difficult to, uh, with the separation on the bus. Um, and we're looking at, as we move into the blended model of ensuring that we can do the best that we can to split our buses up in the blended model. So let's say on a bus, 50 kids typically ride on that bus. We're gonna to try to take a look at those from those schools and say, okay, can we, put if this if these 50 kids are put it in for the blended model can we have half of them come uh, as group a and the other half b when they're doing that every other day model to reduce the number on the bus but there's specific protocols on getting on that bus and that would be the one area that we would really look at unless again there's a health issue uh, or spe specific health concern uh, regarding that the mask on, on getting on the bus I ask you, Dr. Enfield, is the young being affected by COVID-19? I'm, I'm not a uh, health expert, so I'm going to stay away from, 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 from that, Mr. Mr. Cruz. And, and for this year, there won't be any more football, volleyball? No, we, that decision has not been, has not been made. Um, you know, they're, they're still looking at uh, the, the sports, I think, um, CIF came out with some guidelines, but CIF is leaving it up to the school districts to open up sports. Uh, again, I'm in conversation 
uh, with a number of superintendents regarding the the sports programs. And and right now in in, in our county, we're, we're we haven't moved forward with that. They're starting to look at some guidelines to where they could start to potentially start to do some conditioning. Um, but again, that's small groups of kids coming together um, and being very spread out in doing some of that conditioning. So we will work with our uh, act activities directors and our, and, uh, our site administrators uh, looking at the CIF guidelines um, and then improving what we would say is approving and expanding on those guidelines. And we're looking at developing phases uh, if we were to start the sports, what phases would they start to potentially open up in? And each sport is different. Um, for instance, when you look at tennis, they're, they're, you know, they're on a court and two people kind of far away from each other hitting a ball, but they're still hitting and touching that ball. Um, if you look at golf, you know, you have some, some distance in, in that. But when you get to the, foot, the, the one sport that's coming up and uh, you'll hear a lot about it, is the football. That is a very close contact physical sport. You're in a huddle. You're very close together. When you come off a line, you're hitting, tackling. And, and so uh, there, 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 there's a lot uh, regarding the opening of, those, of that sport. So they're looking at potentially, are they going to delay that? They've talked about, are they going to have it uh, in the winter? Are they going to roll it to the spring? We don't know. Um, and again, that's that. The, the important piece is, is working with all the other school district superintendents and trying to be consistent of doing that together, uh, yes. of opening those sports. So we're in that conversation um, because I know that that, that's that's one out there, but you know, the professional sports haven't even come, yeah. have, haven't even come back, um, and they have doctors and all those people on the sidelines to 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 do a lot of testing more so than than what we would uh, ever have. Yeah. So, Doctor Info, so like PE, all the kids will be like six feet apart, correct? Yeah, they they're they're able to spread out outside and and to get that distancing yeah. with themselves. Uh, uh, yeah, that's going to be the, the critical piece with them. So at six feet, the wind, that's where it ends, six feet. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, Ms. Bunny, I've got a couple follow-up questions, and we'll get back to you, if you don't mind. Um, I, I have to apologize. I re was remiss earlier when I was uh, talking about accountability. I actually had a Part A and a Part B, and I only got to Part A, which was our staff and instructional accountability. Uh, the Part B question was, what are we going to do to ensure student accountability, uh, that the students are participating, and what are we doing to push out, especially if we're in distance learning 2.0, that our parents and students understand that this is no longer a no harm grade situation, that these are in fact graded uh, assignments and will be um, put into their grade totals. So I think communication is going to be really important from the onset. So we do have a communication plan that we're planning on sharing and, and, and pushing out. The other thing we have already started on are some protocols that school sites and teachers can follow when a student has begun instruction and then all of a sudden is not showing up. So what steps are we district-wide going to commit to to one find out what could be going on in the house so that we can provide support so we can bring them along right back into the classroom setting. So unless there is different guidance from the state regarding grading, our intention right now is to take attendance daily and also for grading to apply following normal district policy. Okay. Um, and this was touched on a little bit. Thank you very much for that. This is a separate topic. It was touched on a little bit as far as sports. Uh, if we have to start with either distance learning 2.0 or a hybrid model, is that going to affect uh, some of our elective classes at our secondary level and our extracurricular activities? It will not affect our electives in the sense that we will still offer our electives. The activities that are chosen and, and completed during class time may look different to ensure 
the safety of our, our students. Okay. But right now we're not anticipating uh, having to um, either postpone or put on hold any of our electives for our, our, our secondary students? Yes. Okay. Uh, and then real quick, a little follow-up to Cal Aero. Uh, I know we're starting with uh, Distance Learning 2.0 with them um, in a couple of weeks. Um, is that, has that been communicated to them effectively already? The parents and students understand that that's the way they're starting? Or are yeah. they finding out about it tonight? Several weeks ago, Dr. Enfield had sent a letter to the Cal Aero community. Okay. Um, that they would be starting with distance learning 2.0. And last week we had the opportunity to meet with two teacher leaders on Cal at the Cal Aero site, also to be able to share the expectations for what distance learning 2.0 would look like. And we also um, received a lot of input as to what support they would need in order for this to be successful at Cal Aero. Good. Um, I think it's important. Um, and have we started the communication process with them to um, set the expectations, not just for staff, but also for their students? Because I think they're going to kind of be, um, I don't want to say our test case, but I mean, they're the first ones to go back. And so um, I, I think we need to make sure that the communication with them is maybe even to a certain degree overboard um, and that they um, have a free exchange of communication with the district as needed, uh, both staff and parents, um, as we're working through this, because uh, they're going to be the first ones going back to this model. Yes, so we have begun, well, we have um, startup a startup checklist for Cal Aero administration, and additionally, to ensure a smooth transition Every Wednesday, we have standing meetings with site administration to be able to answer any questions and also to be able to provide support. And we'll continue that through the transition into distance learning. Thank you very, very much. I'm, I'm very happy to hear that. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Gagne, please. Thank you. Um, so I just want to confirm that as a parent, um, you know, should one elect to uh, go through one of our virtual learning distance learning options um, that's available through alternative education or otherwise, will they be able to do that through the entirety of the 2020-2021 academic year if they so choose? Yes, so that option will be available to all parents, um, at least tentatively through the next through the next school year. However, if a parent chooses to um, participate in traditional instruction and would want to move over to blended or would start on blended and would want to move over to, to a, a traditional model, we will be looking at those transitions at logical breaks at the trimester, at the elementary, junior high, at the semester, at the high school. Thank you. Um, and in terms of masks, just to confirm, so we are not requiring students to wear masks at any grade level, but we are requiring all staff and all visitors to have masks on on our campuses. That's correct. Okay. Um, and then my next question is kind of in the weeds, but it's kind of interactive. People keep emailing me as we're doing this, so I'm going to jump in with this one. Um, we live in an area which, you know, sometimes has inclement weather, whether the Santa Ana winds or rain unexpectedly. Um, and I'm assuming that given COVID and the airflow issue that it, that it helps to, re to reduce the, the aerosol spread, Many of our teachers might keep windows or, or doors open. Um, do we have any tentative plans in case we have wildfires, which cross my fingers, we really don't need that this year after everything that's been going on. But do we have plans for if there is inclement weather? I mean, we just don't know when this is going to end, um, you know, what so our contingency plans would be. I ask because in looking at the district's plans, um, I know we're going to be encouraging, you know, the use of outdoor space uh, as an alternative. So I didn't know if we'd given any thought to if that's not going to be an option due to weather? Well, I think, you know, if it rains or if there's fires and stuff, that's going to be a issue that we're going to, that's going to hinder us uh, in, in providing that distancing. Um, and so we, we understand that. Uh, and that's why we're, we, when they come back, we're going to do the best that we possibly can uh, under those conditions. But there may be times where you can't because of something that comes up like that. 
Um, and in terms <laughs> of uh, food provision, back, I, I'm sorry, Ms. Ganya, but but also that also depends on the school site. Some school sites have more area; they have more room so that they can spread the students out. And other school sites just don't have that that luxury. And so it's going to also depend school by school. And are the food options on our campus all going to be prepackaged? That's the current guideline, and we're going to follow that as much as possible. Thank you. Any other questions, Ms. Gagne? I don't think so. I have a question. Mr. Cruz, please. You know, on the JAMA network, on the 26-2020, turbulent gas clouds with respiratory pathogen emissions, potential implication for reducing transmission of COVID-19, they said approximately 23, 27 feet. So I'll just share that with you. Now, in, in concern with the masks, you, you know the consequences will result, and that would be most likely more vaping and more drugs. So that's one thing that we'll have to take in consideration. And also another thing too is the restrooms. You know, you know, over 20 years in education, the restrooms get really bad, really filthy. And there's been studies when it comes to the boys' restrooms versus the girls' restrooms. The girls' restrooms are the dirtiest in terms of pathogens because they're putting their makeup on. And then when it comes, when, when you compare the doorknob to the stalls is the doorknob that's the most dirtiest. So, you know, we have to be real sensitive because when people are going into those restrooms, you know, they're socializing, they're talking. So, so and that's one thing that's privacy. We'll never know what happens in those restrooms. That's what I want to say. Okay. Oh, okay. Thank you, Mr. Cruz. I'm going to do a quick roll call, make sure that uh, the board members don't have any other questions. Mr. Knopf, are you uh, okay? Do you have any other questions or comments? Mr. Cruz, any other questions or comments? No questions. Mrs. Gagne. Uh, one last question and one last comment. <laughs> Go ahead. It never ends. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so what about other activities? So we discussed athletics um, and the considerations there, but what about bands and other activities? Some of these things are easily more socially distanced than others. Those are going to fall under the same guidelines um, because as you know, band and the different sports, some sports uh, I would say have even more separation than band and stuff. And so those guidelines will be for activities and sports. They'll kind of go hand in hand of what we're going to ask to develop for uh, the phases of starting to implement any of those programs. Uh, and I just want to echo uh, Mr. Schaefer's questions and comments earlier. Um, I'm really concerned about the students and staff at Boys Republic. Um, you know, our, our staff there are deeply committed to those students, um, and those students are there through court mandates. Um, and I just want to make sure we're being really conscientious about it. And if we are taking one of our campuses back just through distance learning, I just want to make sure we're being equitable across the board with all of our students because they all should be treated equally. All right. Uh, is that it, Ms. Gunny? Yep. Thank you. Uh, and our staff should be treated uh, with some parity also. Um, I just have one comment, actually two comments. Um, Dr. Infit, I'll give you the opportunity to make any comments though before. Oh no, I'm good. <laughs> Said enough already, huh? <laughs> um, couple of uh, things, just we talked about open doors and windows, airflow and that kind of stuff. I'd just like to make sure that as we're training our staff and providing information to them that we're also keeping in mind our safety protocols and procedures uh, for active shooter incidences and everything else. Um, I, I believe our current policy is doors are to remain closed and locked during uh, instructional time. So um, I just make sure that we're I'd like to make sure that we're um, adhering to that uh, and staying safe. And then I, I don't I hope nobody thought I was rude because I was checking my phone quite a bit uh, during this study session. Um, and I can't tell you the number of emails and text messages I got received from educators and other board members in other districts. And I, this is a kudos to staff. To a T, they all said uh, what a great presentation this was and how far ahead our district is to theirs uh, in comparison to theirs. And that's not just districts in San Bernardino County, but also Orange County. And so um, I, 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 applied all, I applaud all of you for all of the difficult work and all of the time that you put into this. And on behalf of all of our families and students, I thank you all very, very much. Uh, with, that, with no other comments or questions, I now adjourn the special 
uh, study session of the Board of Education at 6.49 p.m. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Thank you.